Um, we have next Dr. Edward Dickinson. Um, Edwards, again, is, is, is quite an, an extraordinary individual in that um, he used to be a consultant. He's a, he's a medic, a consultant with the NHS. And um, he's been living um, in, and, um, in, in and out of India, but more in India since you've retired, um, in, in a place called Amber, which is uh, not far from Jaipur in uh, Rajasthan. And um, Edwards initiated um, uh, a, a project or a platform called Amber, Amber Arts, which I know we've, we've had many conversations. I mean, this is one of the other things about Brit India is, is that we all get to know each other. We have dinners and lunches together. You explore ideas. You, 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 get, to, um, you get to interface at a, at a more relevant level level perhaps because if 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 edward lives in that community um his his knowledge and his ear that's always picking up on gossip and political references and all of that you know all that can get melded into a more live uh strategic uh, type of um, artistic activity and i often find that when we have to go through arts councils and british councils and you know all these all these kind of slightly fogied um, platforms, you, you, they're a little bit um, out of sync. So um, I, don't know if I, if, I don't know if that's okay to say, but I, this is my, my observation. So I think, I think it's best you just speak about it. Yeah? Edward Dickinson. Thank you very much for that eulogy, uh, Ketna, very kind. So uh, namaste, good morning everybody. Or as we say in the countryside of Rajasthan, Ram Ram. That's what everybody says. So thank you very much indeed for involving me in this exciting day. I'm very honoured to um, participate. I'm going to talk about a sort of captivating dream I've been having for some time, which is now turning into reality. And the dream is about setting up a vibrant art scene in Amber, Amir, in the wondrous desert state of uh, Rajasthan. And so as not to shock you, I put a fairly toned down slide today the colours of Rajasthan are much brighter, much more vibrant, everything's moving, the sound and smell and everything else. And if you're inspired to ask any questions or have any comments at all, I'd be really um, grateful as we go along. <coughs> I'm going to work two machines as we go, let's hope it works. So in the next 15 minutes or so, Madam Chair, is that all right? I'm going to talk about the first three phases of this project, but I'm first going to give you a little bit of context uh, and end by talking about uh, the, the emergent vision of the, of the project. So first, a little bit about Amber, the anglicised version. It's spelt Amber, but it's called Amir. Um, it's a beautiful historic town close to Jaipur, which is the state capital of Rajasthan, top left-hand corner of India. It's deserty, colourful, very Indian, quite traditional, and it's best known for the stunning uh, Amber Palace, or Amber Fort, which is shown in this picture, which is really on every tourist track. Everybody who visits Jaipur usually visits Amir and usually visits Amber Palace. And this was the royal seat, the local seat, uh, until modern Jaipur was built in the 18th century. Um, and as such, historically, this town, which is quite small, 10 or 20,000, nobody's quite sure, um, was a centre for cultural and artistic expression. Artists were brought from all over South Asia to participate. And, of course, this strangely sat side by side with the martial prowess. This was a martial world. Uh, this was a world of defending yourself against invaders as well. But now it's well connected both to the city and to the surrounding countryside, but interestingly along the very historic uh, routes of war and trade and, and pilgrimage, of course. So, um, a little bit about me. I, I live in Armea about half of the year, and we've had a base there for about 20 years altogether. I retired early from the NHS, where I was a hospital consultant, as Ketna mentioned. And I really wanted to add another chapter to my life in India. And as a lifelong art lover, I really wanted to make a contribution to our community in India um, in the arts. And to be honest, I was feeling a little bit of an underachiever uh, and I was feeling peer pressure 
real peer pressure to get something done. Because when I was a teenager, in my teenage peer group were William Yeoard, the interiors man, who you might not have heard of, but you might have some of his dinnerware on your table. Uh, a very interesting man called Huey Arnold, who's an international fashion photographer. Jennifer Saunders, who was really quite boring as a teenager. Sorry, Jennifer, to say that. And a chap who always produced all our family shrouds at Christmas time. I was called uh, Richard Curtis and went on apparently to do something in films. So I, these were my teenage pals. And so I really felt peer pressure. I've got to get something done, Dickinson. Let's get moving. Uh, next bit of context is about working in India. And I'm lucky to know a reasonable about, a, a, amount about this, though, of course, one can never fully know about working in India. And we've been lucky enough to do some community work in Amir on education. And we've built an eco-trail where thousands of kids come to learn about eco-issues. And here are some of the happy victims, uh, audience members, visitors uh, who visitor, visited us. And we set up a charity called uh, Amber Trust for this work. And in the last two years, because NGOs have been getting a sort of bad name in India, we've transformed this into India Inspiration Initiative. And the project I'm describing, Amber Arts, is a collaboration between India Inspiration Initiative and, and Brit India. We've got good contacts and network locally, and a lot of experience of working with the local and state government, uh, which could be the subject of another set of complete set of lectures, I should think, probably. And as a result, we know a fair amount about how things work in India, um, with those caveats that I mentioned, particularly the strengths and interests of doing business in India. Uh, the just-in-time, sometimes people call it last minute, but it's officially just-in-time, which people are fantastic as. Real event expertise, events just pop up. This is mainly in the, in the field of people getting married, weddings, but fantastic expertise into turning sort of a field into a fantastic event virtually overnight. Um, a strong leaning towards multi-pronged approaches to everything. Um, so people are very happy to have lots of agendas going on, lots of things going on, and in fact thrive on it. And there's the festival culture and general joie de vivre, which this photo hopes to show, but Indian life is... it's. By and large, although there are political issues, it's a happy life, and people are full of joy, very friendly, uh, welcoming, and, and, and good people. So um, let's turn now to phase one of the projects, which were its origins. And uh, this was before we had had much practice of doing selfies, so apologise for the shot, but it records. Uh, Hi Ching and I meeting to chat. I'd come across Hai Ching in Armia, and we met in a field where I think he was rehearsing with some local art artists and encouraging them. And somehow we'd been connected through medical relatives. I'm not quite sure how. Anyway, we met, and straight away I realised that I, re I needed to support Tai Ching. He'd come all this way, he was doing great work, needed support. So that's how we started our relationship. And we met again a few months uh, later in London. This is early April 2016, I guess. And by that time, a few months later, I'd been inspired by Hai Ching and done quite a lot of desk research and what, tried to ponder how we might uh, possibly collaborate. And uh, I, I knew that we could put on a show, um, but I really wanted to find something in the artistic world which would last longer than a few days, would be really embedded locally and that would be sustainable and economically viable and have an economic footing to go forward. And that ultimately it would serve some higher goals uh, in the community. And amongst others, I'd been inspired by the work of Vanessa Branson, who's here on the left with one of her curators, I think, who started up the Marrakesh uh, Biennale, which is really, a f I haven't been, but judging by what I've read about it in the photo, it looks like an incredible um, art event. Um, to get the ball rolling, um, I suggested to Hai Ching straight away that we should start really big and we should start Amber Biennale. And he nearly fell off his seat, uh, but recovered quickly. But we ran with this idea, and this is uh, the brainstorm that we did. I know that you can't read it, but I really wanted to show that this was a complete brain dump. Virtually everything that was in our brains went on to this, about what we could do in the arts field in Armia. And this led to lots of emails and discussion. 
But it, what it really did is opened our minds to the possibility of a wide range of programming, educational, cultural, creative, and digital, but also covering the full range of arts, from visual, performing arts, design, media arts, allied act activities, and all the way through to digital again. And as a result of this discussion, I mean, quite a lot of the branches have been tr pruned on this mind map now, but um, I can recommend Coggle, by the way, for mind maps. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, from this, we went on to the next phase, phase two, which was uh, a scoping exercise. So first of all, I really want to put my finger in the wind and see what did people really think about art in, it, in a most general sense, and to see whether the time was right to try and do something and, and get moving. And I discovered that there's a real interest in art in India, and this is mainly, I think, fueled by the uh, wealthy and upper middle classes with their disposable income. There's a big art show annually in Delhi, India Art, and other art events are popping up throughout the subcontinent. Plus Jaipur, 10 kilometers down the road from my home in Amir, is a very creative and vibrant place, uh, mainly around jewelry and fashion, but it, there's a lot going on. And taking soundings in my social circle, it became clear that the appreciation of art was, uh, was on the up. There's strong local support for culture. In fact, every week, uh, whether it's to um, a music recital, a uh, fashion show, a book reading, there are a small number of art shows. And of course, Jaipur Literature Festival, known throughout the world, which started as eight people in a room. Um, and the people of Jaipur came out and supported the JLF, as we call it, Jaipur Literature Festival, and it grew exponentially there, uh, thereafter. And this picture is of the sort of state art gallery, which is, a, a, as you can see, is a beautiful and very modernistic building. And very significantly, uh, this has a new director. Seems like uh, a lady who can make things work in this, in this vibrant world. But having said all this, it's all quite fragmented and there's no recognised project taking things forward and certainly nobody championing the arts in a, in a consistent way. The next bit of scoping was to look at uh, where, is there any artistic talent, is there any art activity? And again, uh, I was amazed just to find what was going on. And I met some really amazing artists, and I'm going to run just two, through two or three of them. But this is the work of Nikhil Bandari, who lives locally. And if you've gone through Delhi Airport and glimpsed upwards, admittedly your focus may have been on the queue in front and having your passport ready, but if you glimpsed upwards, you'd see this huge hands, these mudra on the walls. And he's also done huge yoga installations. Wonderful chat. I call him India's mega artist, which I think he thinks is being a personal but it's not. He does these mega artworks. Ankit Patel, another great and senior artist who used to carve in granite and now casts in bronze. Uh, Anshu Pavan, a very interesting lady who's got the means to be able to be what she describes as being an independent artist. She does huge canvases and last year simply took herself to the Indian Art Fair in Delhi. A guy called Cartist who started out uh, restoring very old cars, beautiful Daimlers, Mercedes, all sorts, and now is a sort of producer of car-relating artistic events. Absolutely fascinating. And finally, just to mention, a guy called Madan Mina, who again is local, comes from, uh, at least lives very close to where we live, who's most interested in documenting tribal art, which we're going to hear about more this morning. But his own personal artwork brings together tribal art his interests in uh, a, a modern vernacular and the world of crafts. Uh, absolutely fascinating man. Uh, and there are many, many more. But the most important thing that emerged, apart from all this talent, is that all the huge number of young artists are struggling. I mean, that's right and proper from an artist, as I understand. I don't know. They're struggling. But there's a very strict hierarchy. Unless you've gone to the right person, guru, school, progressed up the hierarchy, it's very difficult to break out and to do something. And this hierarchy seems to be very rigid. And young artists not only feel it's difficult to uh, project themselves and f fulfil what they wish to do, um, but they also feel isolated because it engenders a uh, competition, which would, I would say currently was a little bit possibly unhealthy. So that's the artists. 
Uh, next, I scope the galleries and spaces. Not much to find, I'm afraid. Um, but I did discover two of the very best galleries on my doorstep. On the left is a gallery called Art Chill, which is inside that palace I showed you at the beginning. Amazing. And it's run by my friend Sangeeta, who's on the right. And it's being opened on the left by Princess Dear Kumari, another good friend. Um, and you can see the level at which uh, there's interest in art. And more recently, I found on the right a place called, a space called the Indian Contemporary Art Gallery, which is curated by the guy striding through the middle, Haim Rana, who's actually Nepalese. Fantastic, huge white space, three floors, beautifully lit, uh, which is uh, going to play a big part in, in, in the future. So quite a bit there on the, uh, on the gallery front. On the spaces front, in Amir itself, I found on the left this old cinema. It had closed 20 years ago. So it's not projecting very well with the lights on. But imagine the 1950s and imagine a garish, uh, beautifully painted Indian cinema. It's sitting there empty. It's just waiting for, to be turned into an art centre. And the other big find was slightly smaller on the right, though, of course, in real life, much bigger. Along the highway for 10 kilometres north of Amir, huge numbers of hotels are being built. And this one happens to be our, be our favourite hotel, the Fairmont. And they've got gallery, uh, get what can be used as gallery space throughout the hotels, foyers, their conference areas used for weddings, etc., etc. So hopefully they will be able to participate uh, with us as well. So that was an interesting journey. And the last bit of scoping was looking at indigenous art and crafts and what's going on. Um, anybody who has visited Rajasthan will be aware that you're immediately exposed to lots of crafty types of things. And I was increasingly aware that even the decorations that we just used at home, that's painting in our home top left, actually are the uh, top of a big iceberg of indigenous art. And there are lots of other crafts, such as uh, block printing on the bottom right, very, very big in, in, in Jaipur and Amir. Bottom left, a lot of uh, marble carving. Often it started with religious icons, but now it's grown to all sorts of things. And in top right, I was driving through the countryside and I saw a big hand emerging over a fence. And I went in and found one of these statue-making places, building statues about... You can see there's a small man in front with a pink shirt. Well, he's about five foot five. So you can see that these statues are really massive. And there's a real expertise in, in knocking these up more or less overnight. So some uh, wonderful uh, uh, crafts which exist there. But having done all of this, it seemed like a proper audit was needed. And that takes us on to uh, the next phase of the project, um, which is about creative capital. Now, I'm sure members of the audience who are better informed than I was then know all about this, but I was doing a lot of Googling of creativity. What a sad life I lead, no. And I came across the idea of creative capital. And it so happened that all the information was about how Cardiff had done a huge audit of creative capital and a big report and had set up things to try and uh, improve the creative life uh, of Cardiff, but more importantly, to boost the, the local economy. And I discovered around this area of creative capital, there are definitions, there's even a UN programme on creative cities. And as I looked into it more, I found more and more examples of creative capital, creative precincts, creative corridors, all around the world being used to not only foster the arts, but also develop communities and improve economies. And I thought this is a really fantastic, fantastic idea. And, uh, it, uh, and reading about this gave absolutely fascinating insights as to what you could do with the members and what, how you could help them move forward. So this is now becoming a live piece of work. And over the next two or three months, I'm going, to, I'm going back to India in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be mapping out the Amber Creative Corridor, which is 20 kilometres long. And I'm going to walk over here and point out. This is the walled city of Jaipur here. And this is the city palace, which I take is the southern end of the Creative Corridor. And it comes out here through quite a busy sort of area and then comes past this Mansaga Lake, which has the Jal Mahal 
which was in my very first slide, that beautiful lake with the pavilion. Then goes up through the hills, winding, 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 until you come down to our mere. This is the lake. There's a huge palaces here overlooking it. This is the little town of our mere. And then we join the old Delhi Road, which goes up along the ridge of the mountains, up north to beyond Cucas, about 20 kilometres in all. And this is the area where I'm going to be setting about um, mapping, uh, partly inspired by humans, in New humans of New York. If anybody has seen the work of, uh, what is he called, Brandon Stanton, Humans of New York. So I'm going to find all the creatives, I'm going to interview them, I'm going to photograph them, I'm going to video them, and, they will, and find all the spaces and other potential members as we go along the way, and use all this information initially for a show that would be used on social media, blog, etc., etc. So I'm looking forward to a really busy time. The monsoon's just about to hit Rajasthan. It's 46 at the moment, so nice and cool. When the monsoon comes, it'll cool down, become very green, and it's the ideal season for, uh, for um, field work. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So we've now got, so that's the real first bit of concrete work turning this vision into reality. And uh, we're now becoming a clearer idea of what Amber Arts is and will be. Um, first of all, it's very important today, um, but not just today, to say it's a binational project and partnership as shown in this slide by I3, which is India Inspiration Initiative, and Brit India on the right, some kind of pop, pop art, wonderful pop art representation. The goal of the project is to promote the arts celebrate creative capital, improve the local economy, and encourage cultural trade. And there's an interesting underlying slogan here, which is art for development, which echoes some wonderful work which a fashion designer called B.B. Russell has done on fashion for development, taking homespun Khadi material India and using it for high fashion. This has been done in Rajasthan, so we've got fashion for development and art for development. It feels right. And the role of Amber Arts will be to catalyse and organise and add value. And in particular, bring a big vision to this. Uh, hopefully energy, we need lots of people to help out. Facilities, those spaces that we looked at. Resources, whether they're people or things or maybe even money, that would be really good. Connections. And particularly for the young artists, a means to collaborate. And all of this, I hope, will make possible activity which is bubbling under the surface, but now can be turned into reality. So, um, I think, yes, I've come to the end of those slides, but I've got a little bit more to say. So the work streams are the Amber Creativity Corridor, which we've talked about. We're then going to start, in fact, it's sort of started now, Positive Action for Art in Rajasthan. Championing art, creating interest, and providing a focus. What our younger people would just say, well, that's ordinary social media activity, but it needs to actually have a proper label to be carried out. A young artist collective to bring together young people, young artists to uh, network, uh, show and tell, hear master classes, there's a huge range of activities, and outreach into schools. And ultimately, taking us right back to sort of where we started in our thinking, an Amber Art Season, uh, a multi-event programme during the winter months when all the tourists are, are visiting, but not just for tourists, for, for, for local people as well. So I'm going to finish there by just saying, in conclusion, I gave you a little context of the marvellous, colourful town of Amir with its connections between the city and the countryside. I talked about the origins of the project in this chance meeting in a field with Hai Ching, who is here, he's at the back, smiling and waving. The scoping exercise in phase two, which really revealed that there were very strong foundations and lots of resources uh, that, that could be harnessed. And, uh, and finally talked about uh, the bigger vision, including the first piece of concrete work, work on the uh, Amber Creativity Corridor. I would like to thank some people before I stop. Um, thank you to all of those who I've met along the way, um, who've given encouragement, but even more importantly, the ones who've given critical friendship. 
And most of all, um, big love, of course, to our Panjandrum, Hai Ching, as I call him, pop artist, Ketna Patel. And uh, I call him our well, my Welsh resident, John Redding. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>